Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And today we have Ann Barter of the Fearless Health Podcast. And today we are talking all about dopamine and serotonin and how your feel-good transmitters, your neurotransmitters, really can help with food cravings, including sugar, chips, all kinds of stuff. So Anne, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super psyched to be here. So it's going to be fun to share this information today. Well, let's first answer the question, what is a neurotransmitter? Because a lot of people don't even know what that is. So let's start with that. Yeah. So it's fancy. There are chemical messengers of your entire body. Most people, when they think of neurotransmitters, they think of only the brain. And that is true. They definitely are active in the brain, but there also are feel good neurotransmitters. They are, um, are what regulates our mood, helps with our learning, helps with our cravings. They are also going to make your muscles twitch. They will move things along through your GI system. So they have a ton of functions. It's just basically the way that your neurons communicate with the rest of your body. Got it. And so let's talk about serotonin and dopamine specifically. What do they, how do they work and how do, how is that linked to your eating and how does it link to depression and also how you're feeling? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to kind of tell a story if that's okay to just sort of sum it up. So initially when I got into practice, I would put people on an elimination diet to figure out what foods they were reacting to. And my patients were all on board. They were super excited. Um, and they would come back two weeks later, really sheepish and say, "I I couldn't do it. Like I had to have carbohydrates. I had to have chips. I couldn't do X, Y, and Z. And they would always say, oh, this is just such a willpower issue. I'm so bad at this. I stink. I'm worthless. And that whole um, scenario that's really upsetting to hear somebody be so down on themselves. And so I started really thinking about it. And these were very, very motivated people that really wanted to change. It was like they couldn't. There was this barrier. And I, I, I spent some time trying to figure out how I got through to get through it. And so lo and behold, what happens to me is I started working longer and my commute increased and I, it was just kind of longer hours. And I found myself stopping to get a cookie on the way home from work. And I'm like, what am I doing? I teach people about health every day. And I, it was like this, this thing just drove me to stop at Whole Foods and get this cookie. And it was so irritating to me, but I finally figured out what my patients were talking about, what their struggles were. And I realized with the longer work hours, the increased stress and some environmental toxins that my neurotransmitters were starting to go low. On top of that, I felt fatigued. I felt burnout. I kind of, I felt grumpy. I was a little more irritated. And I would say that when I got home at the end of the day, I would use the word blasted. I'm so exhausted. I'm so blasted. And the only thing that really made me feel a ton better was eating sugar, or eating it to, to boost that up. So neurotransmitters, you know, looking at, for example, dopamine and serotonin, when they start to go really low, we want to get those back up. And so we do things that are legal. So we're going to use food to get those back up. Very processed carbohydrates can help to push those back up and so can sugar. So that's why we gravitate towards that quick fix. So we're like, wow, I feel so much better. That half a donut was amazing. And now in order to get that same fix, I need to do a full donut. Now it ends up to be a complete full dozen of donuts, a dozen donuts to get that same feeling or that same fix to be able to get through the day. And we're starting to see these cravings. And so the food manufacturers are amazing and they know that. So I think in 1998, Nestle did a study and they saw on the supermarket shelves, there were 11,000 new products that hit the shelves, 11,000 in 1998. I wonder what it is now. And those foods are riddled with processed ingredients 
that make us have a feel good feeling when we eat those. Wow, that ketchup was great. And you kind of read through the ingredients and you see sugar be a very sneaky ingredient. That ensures basically that you're going to buy it and you had a great experience with that brand because you're seeing a spike in dopamine. So, and serotonin. So that's really what we see. And then that can get into some binge eating, believe it or not, but I wanted to kind of round that out. So did I somewhat answer the question? Then I can go into some of the mood stuff yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Was there anything there? Okay. So the, so with the, so what they have also found out is they did a study on rats, these poor rats. They did a food deprivation diet for 12 hours on two control set of rats. And on one set, they basically, once once the food deprivation was over, they gave them rat chow, whatever rat chow is, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. And then on the other control group, they gave them rat chow in a sugar solution. And after that, the, the rats that got the sugar solution, they would increase the amount of sugar that they were eating each day. And they measured the dopamine levels in the control group which was in their dopamine levels were normal. And then they measured the levels of the rats that actually have the sucrose solution. And they were 130% over normal what dopamine should be. So it's that feel good. It's that hedonistic chemical. And again, once we do that sugar, that sh- that short burst, we feel good. And then we crash lower than before. And so um, I run a test on um, my patients called an organic acids test. It's called an oats test. And um, much contrary to belief, it has nothing to do with oats, the grain. But um, it's basically looking at a multitude of different things. So it looks to see like what your neurochemicals look like. And so you can figure out how to change these neurochemicals with nutrition and generally what you see people come in with is, um, I would say people come in with sleep issues. They come in with just feeling worthless. Um, they come in with fatigue are the big things that almost everybody complains about. And when you really drill into it, they don't feel as motivated as they once did. Um, they don't feel as connected to their family as they once did. They just don't have the same desire to do arts and crafts and activities or the the other things that they used to do. And so those are actually a combination of all the neurotransmitters. And I can drill down into all of the symptoms of, you know, serotonin and dopamine to know if you're deficient in those, um, what, like basically what it looks like on a symptom level. I, I don't know if you want me to do that. You just let me know. No, I absolutely do. And I think that when most people think of weight loss, they don't usually think of the brain, but the brain has a dramatic impact on body composition. So your appetite is not only the product of your physical body, right? But it also is your psychology. And so I don't, I think people don't realize that it's your hormones and your neurotransmitters that kind of both play such a big part. And wouldn't you say dopamine is probably the most important of the four brain chemicals? I love dopamine because I am just such a dopamine junkie. So I have a preference to it, um, but not everybody does. Um, you, it's, you mentioned just, you brought up such a great point. Um, with, you know, the neurotransmitters regulate, um, will regulate hormones. So dopamine will regulate the adrenal gland and serotonin will regulate the female reproductive hormones. So a pro tip is that if you have PMS or even PMDD for two weeks or a month before your period, that generally means that you're serotonin deficient, believe it or not. So that's a big issue with hormones. Um, so definitely will help regulate your cycle a little bit. It's not the only thing, but it does improve that. So let's say someone says, okay, you know, the problem is, is that most of the foods and stimulants that people crave, things like chocolate, candy, diet sodas. I mean, I have a friend, Heather, and she doesn't drink diet soda very often and she doesn't have chocolate very often, but it's so funny the other day she was really stressed 
And she's like, I'm going to 7-Eleven. And she came back with a Snickers bar and a diet soda. And that's funny. <laughs> so it's like, you know, when she's like, okay, I'm I'm really stressed. She's going to 7-Eleven. She's getting a diet soda and a and a chocolate bar, which she doesn't get very often. Right. Yeah. It's just this this craving that you can't stop because you just are like, I feel like I need to do more or I need to be more motivated or, you know, whatever it is, whatever you need to feel at the time. And you know that the legal way to get that feeling is to probably use sugar or caffeine to get it. Right. So what kind of, first of all, what can people do to balance that out? So we kind of really address the problem. So now how do we fix it? How do we solve it without going to getting that Diet Coke and the Snickers bar? Well, that's a great question. So I wish it was just straightforward and super easy, but unfortunately it's not. It's a little bit more of a complex problem. So neurotransmitters are made in the brain but they're stored in the gut. And so the first thing that we have to look at is what's going on with your gut. What, what issues are you having that might be creating a dysbiosis in bacteria? And so one of the first things I do when people will come in and they have this deficiency is I want to see what their stool test looks like. Um, I want to know what the problem is. And I run a GI map. Um, that's my favorite stool test to see. Most people, what I generally find on this is most people will have a bacterial overgrowth of generally um, an H. pylori infection, which is an infection in your stomach. And what this turkey does is he makes your stomach more alkaline. And so if your stomach is much more alkaline, you can't break down your food and absorb it into your small intestine to actually be able to utilize your nutrients from your food. So that's going to cause nutritional deficiencies. And, and so that contributes because in the pathway, um, serotonin and dopamine have different pathways, but in the pathway, you really need those nutrients. Um, and so some of the nutrients, you know, for serotonin, like B vitamins are so important and you would be amazed at how many people are very deficient in B vitamins. So there's that piece. Um, and I think that that starts in the gut because you want your medicine to be your food, you know, instead of like having to take and do all of these other things, right? I think short term, we fix the problem, but on, on a long term level, your medicine needs to be your food. So the other thing, you know, so gut nutrient deficiencies definitely contribute. Um, we tend to be eating enough tryptophan and tyrosine, which are the amino acid precursors for um, both dopamine and serotonin. Tyrosine for dopamine, tryptophan for serotonin. Um, so I think that it comes down to an absorption issue. The other thing is tryptophan, which is for serotonin, is the last amino acid to get absorbed. So again, you really have to have that gut functioning well. If somebody feels great with really, really heavy duty exercise and then they feel terrible later, that is a, oh my goodness, that's a neurotransmitter dump and you feel great. So there, there's that. Um, the, so I think that those are the major things is I see nutrient deficiencies and I also see, um, and I also see gut issues. Stress is another major issue when it comes to depleting your neurotransmitters. So dopamine is on the same pathway as adrenaline or norepinephrine. And so um, in certain cases, people can't convert between the two. So, so again, kind of back to the nutrition adrenal pathway issue. So um, that's they have a SNP called COMT, which is a genetic SNP. Um, and so you have to be able to transition between these two. So stress actually plays a big role in depleting both of those. Um, so, so that's a contributing factor. Again, your genetics are a slight contributing factor. Um, and I think in just in general, our lifestyle is a little too stressed. We really lack the connection that we need because a lot of times that connection and people around us that really boosts that up and makes us feel good. 
social media can deplete our neurotransmitters, you know? So we're just, we're looking at these things and they can all be depleted. Some of the foods that will bring those back up, avocados are very powerful. Um, in the plantain family, those are also powerful. For dopamine specifically, velvet bean is powerful to bring that back up and also utilizing protein. So anything that's going to be on a more um, keto, paleo type diet that's clean, you should be getting enough of those amino acids. So if you don't feel good, then the problem is that you're not absorbing those, those or you have some nutrient deficiencies. Hey guys, I'm so excited. My new book, One Meal and a Tasting is out now. And if you order the book on Amazon, just the regular paperback edition, if you go in and make a review, you will get the audio book for free. Send a copy of your receipt to questions at chantelrayway.com and you'll get the audio book right away. Mm. So I want to talk about I want to talk about our stomach acid for just a second because I'm really passionate about that. And I think that it's more important that pe- than people think. And I want to dive into the H. pylori a little m- more. So let's break it down simple, right? So like when we were in school, we learned that, you know, we have acidity and like if you look at a pH of seven, that's considered neutral, right? Mm-hmm. And but the stomach requires a very acidic pH. It's like 1.5 to 2.5 to maintain a digestive health, right? Mm-hmm. And so I want you to kind of dive deep into that of of that H pylori and what that does. Number one, how do you know that you have it? Number two, um, what are some symptoms if you don't take the test um, that you go, this might be, you know, one of your symptoms? What a great question. And like, you know, just starting at the top of the digestive tract is so important. So about 60% of the population is infected with H. pylori. If somebody in your house has it, you likely have it because it is just a wildfire in a house, kissing, sharing food. Etc. So generally, if one spouse has it, the other one does. The stomach is so important to be acidic. If you go out to a restaurant and somebody has just mishandled the protein that you're eating or mishandled the food, your stomach is the first line of defense to really break that bacteria or whatever contaminant it is down to make sure that that doesn't take up residence in the entire rest of your GI system. So Um, Some of the symptoms that you will see um, is people have reflux is pretty common. They'll get nauseous. They will feel kind of bloated and full. They'll see pieces of food in their stool. Um, Sometimes they have stinky breath. Is it actually another one? So those are some of the symptoms that you're really going to see. Bloating is huge. And then this is going to all contribute down, you know, as we're trickling down the gut, if you don't have enough stomach acid to break down your food into small pieces to be absorbed into your, um, your small intestine, what's going to happen is you're going to get breaks in your gap junctions. So you're going to get breaks in that gap junction of your intestine and that food is going to leach out. And then these folks come in and they have tons of food sensitivities while I eat chicken and celery. And that's all I do. Chicken and celery. And that's or else I have a rash and I have all these other things. And it's just, I'm like, you can't just eat chicken and celery. That just, that cannot be your diet. Like we're missing a lot of nutrients there. So you'll see, you'll see that the, and where they'll be bloated and gassy after meals because their digestive system is not working appropriately. A lot of folks will have constipation. Some will have diarrhea, but they'll have some IBS like symptoms. How people present will be different. Um, And I think the other thing is most people think that they're going to the bathroom enough um, unless you ask. So you need to go to the bathroom every day. Ideally, you know, more after you eat is better. And for it to have a bowel movement and you want it to be formed and darker color, not super light stool. So I think it's just very, very important. And the the health starts at the stomach. So you really have to break down that food. 
Okay. So if you were a traditional doctor, right? And so let's say you went to a regular doctor and he said, okay, you have H. pylori, you know, a regular doctor would say, okay, you need antibiotics, you need amoxicillin, you need tetracycline, right? Wouldn't that be just the the traditional route that they would take? And I'm a complete, like, I, I'm not a fan of antibiotics, but in, if someone does have it, are you like, look, you know, we may need to go ahead and give you antibiotics. What is your opinion on like, if someone, if someone came to you and said, yes, we've, we've diagnosed it, you do have H. pylori, what's their next route to fix it? I feel like that's my last resort. I will generally use herbal antimicrobials to fix it as well as a biofilm blocker. So um, that's it to, to dissolve the biofilm because this bacteria is really, really smart and it creates a biofilm or film around itself. And it takes the nutrients from your food and it eats it and it replicates and gets stronger. So it can be a little bit of a bear to get rid of. So I will clear, I'll use a biofilm dissolver like serapeptidase as well as I'll use antimicrobials. And I will switch those up. In a few situations, I've had to send out for antibiotics. Um, Very, very rarely do I have to do that. I call that a last resort on it. Um, But yeah, I try not to. There has been some really interesting um, literature that's come out. A couple things that I think are important. Number one, if you tend towards iron deficiency anemia and you continue to just take, oh, cool, you'll like this. If you continue to take more and more iron, but yet your iron levels on your lab work, they, the, this bacteria will steal it to replicate, to make it bigger, to make themselves bigger and stronger and more colonized. And then they can leak out to other parts of your body and have problems. So the more iron you take, the more you feed them. The same thing will happen with B vitamins as well. So this will actually help them to colonize. So for me, what I do in practice is I make sure that this isn't here before I'm going to give nutraceuticals to boost up those levels because I don't want to make these turkeys stronger. Um, And so I've seen that a fair amount. It's a, it's a hidden cause of iron deficiency anemia. So there's, yeah, so there's definitely that. Um, that will contribute. So there's some other interesting research that's come out more recently. Um, having a good diverse microbiome, um, utilizing lactobacillus species, along with killing these things off, actually has good outcomes to not get reinfected. And the other thing that's really important is including that H. pylori Uh, or I'm sorry, including the HDL supplement or pancreatic enzyme supplement as soon as you can, if you're not going to give somebody ulcer. So like, you know, making sure you get through kind of the first round of the killing protocol, but then ultimately really incorporating that, the um, HDL as long as well as pancreatic enzymes to stop a reinfection. And it, it makes sense that we'd get so infected because we're so stressed And when we're stressed, you know, the blood is going to leave the GI system and you're not going to be able to break down your food very well. So it's just like a perfect environment to get set up with a good old fashioned H. pylori infection. So for someone like that, would you suggest, let's say someone had a really bad case in that case, would you say, okay, let's, you know, if the supplements weren't working, you would say, let's get on antibiotics and then like, what would be your best one that you would say, use this and then let's rebuild your gut? Um, Antibiotic wise, um, it really depends if they are. So there's generally um, when they're treating H. pylori, there is, they do um, four antibiotics in one generally. So they're mixing up four in one um, is the the general medical approach between two and four um, to get rid of an H. pylori infection. So um, I think it just depends. I think it depends if the patient is breastfeeding, if they're nursing, um, and you just want to vary it. So if it doesn't work and you want to retest, so it, it's, it's, yeah, that's my, um, antibiotics are not my forte, mm-hmm. um, but they mix between two and four to kill off an H. pylori infection. And then what, 
do you have any supplements that you recommend to then rebuild someone's gut? Yeah, I do. Um, I utilize um, an IB. I use utilize an IBS supplement that's um, that's on the website. It's just called IBS Support. So I utilize that. I do it in pretty high doses initially. I have packets of powder, so I'll use that. Um, it's a combination of lactobacillus and, and bifido bacteria that really is going to stimulate and build that up. I love to see a GI map before I do that. The reason for that is, is because I want to see what the balance is between Saccharomyces boulardii and the lactobacillus, because sometimes you can get people in balance and I want to give them what they really need. But generally in the research, um, you know, the IBS support is what is what really fixes it and helps. Wow. <laughs> Sorry on the big fancy names, uh, but I just, probiotics are so specific. Well, this has been awesome. What have I not asked you that you want listeners to know about this topic? I think um, most people think that they're really broken and that they really have a problem and that nobody can fix them. And I, I hate to hear that. And that is absolutely 100% not true. Your product of marketing with um, with big food, um, and I think really trying to eat food that comes from the earth, food you know, food that's more natural. Shopping on the outer perimeter of the grocery store so important, and I'm sure you know. I know you've been through all that big time, but um, but that's I think the big stuff is that you are not broken, and I think that people think that they are, and you are not beyond repair. Mm. Love that. Well, this has been amazing. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Yes. So um, you can find me on fearlesshealthpodcast.com. Um, we have a lot of stuff there. We also have a practice. So I'm not going to add that in. And then you can find me by my name on my Instagram handle. Awesome. And uh, tell people about your own intermittent fasting. So what eating window do you do and how does intermittent fasting really help your gut? Yeah. So I basically eat, um, in really primarily a seven to eight hour window. It depends sometimes six, but in that area, um, for me, I don't like to eat when I'm stressed. And so I'm pretty busy. And so I want to be able, you know, we talked about stomach acid. That's really important. So it really helps my gut not be bloated, especially eating on the run. When I eat on the run, I do not like to do that. So I think that it's taken the pressure off having to eat all the time and having that rhetoric that you need to eat all the time. And I actually love full-blown fasting. So I like to give my body a break occasionally, you know, for 24, um, to 72 hours on just fasting, to just let my body heal up and heal the mitochondria. And so I, I really have always been a fan of fasting for about 20 years. Awesome. I do want to ask your opinion about coffee on mm -hmm. kind of a healthier microbiome. It's funny because I just read an article and it said, could something like, could more coffee bring a healthier microbiome or something like that? And, you know, it's like, you know, you feel like one person says one thing, one person says another. I'd love to hear your opinion on what you think about coffee and if someone has some gut issues, H. pylori, some of these other major gut infections, do you feel like the, you know, coffee makes things worse and what's your opinion? What a good question. I don't have a straightforward answer on this um, because I don't think that everybody needs to be off of it and I don't think everybody needs to be on it. So where I think the best way to figure out how you react and how you respond to coffee specifically, um, first off, I think you need a mold-free type of coffee. That's why that's very, very important because mold is on the hierarchy of the microbiome. Mold is like the puppet master that will feed, you know, parasites and um, bacteria and especially candida because candida and mold, they are kissing cousins. If you have if you have mold, you definitely have candida. So like very, very moldy coffees, or if you're in a moldy house or been exposed to mold and haven't really detoxed it, I think that really knowing where your coffee is sourced from is important. Um, the second thing that I would say about that 
is I would check your blood sugar levels about an hour. I would check your blood sugar levels fasting, and I would check your blood sugar levels between an hour and two hours after you drink coffee. Some people will spike 30 points. I would say, you know, that's just like eating a meal. That's not, I don't think it's great. Um, it definitely, coffee, if you have an H. pylori infection, coffee can definitely make that worse because that can contribute to ulcers at that point. So I think you just have to know what's going on with you. And also I think a good way to check at home is number one, you know, just run a GI test. Number two, check your blood sugar levels. Love it. Well, thank you so much for being on with us. This has been awesome. Thank you so much. And you guys stay tuned. We have another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now.